Liz, I believe you're right here. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, welcome. We're delighted that you're here. Uh, this I I've lost track. I think this is the fourth or the fifth. Fifth. Uh, fifth. fifth. This is the sixth, fifth. I believe. In the series that we're doing jointly with the with uh, Texas Christian University's Schieffer School of Journalism, and CSIS, they of course are celebrating the fact that Bob Schieffer is one of their alums. I would do the same if I were TCU. Uh, we're delighted, to, however, to have this partnership, and uh, the goal is to bring a reasoned, sensible debate in front of the American people. And of course, to do that, you have to have first-rate and enormously talented public policy figures and intellects that are going to participate in that discussion. Bob has been leading these, and everybody, we, when we call and ask people to participate, it's never a problem to recruit fine people because they know that he's a fine and fair journalist, and we're going to live up to that great tradition. Bob, I'll turn it to you to introduce our panel. Thank, thank you, you very much, John. Uh, thank you all, and uh, welcome again. Uh, as John said, this is the fifth in the series of programs sponsored by CSIS uh, and the Journalism School at TCU. Our uh, previous uh, sessions, those of you who have been to some of them, uh, have been about Afghanistan, about Iraq, uh, about the intelligence community. Our last one uh, was very timely because it was about North Korea. Today, our subject is Iran. Uh, what does its government want? Is it determined to develop nuclear weapons, or does it want nuclear power for peaceful purposes? And what can or should the United States do about it? What should our policy be uh, toward Iran? We have gathered uh, another uh, distinguished panel, perhaps our most distinguished, I would say, as I look here today. Uh, uh, John Alterman, uh, Director, Senior Fellow, the CSIS Middle East Program. He has served on the State Department Policy Planning Staff, was an advisor to the Iraq Study Group, lectures at Johns Hopkins and George Washington University, was an award-winning teacher at Harvard and author or co-author of four books on the Middle East. Elizabeth Cheney, uh, Liz uh, most recently served in government as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Prior to that, she practiced law in the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the private sector in the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group. In 2000, she was Director of Vice Presidential Debate Preps for the Bush-Cheney campaign, has also served as Special Assistant to the Deputy Secretary of State for Assistance to the former Soviet Union and as a U.S. aid officer in Budapest and Warsaw. Uh, Ken Pollack, Director of Research, Senior Fellow at the Sabin Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings. He served as Director of National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He also served on the National Security Council. He's been a research professor at the National Defense University and spent seven years in the CIA. And then uh, Robin Wright, one of America's most uh, informed journalists, I would say, on foreign affairs. She is the uh, diplomatic correspondent for the Washington Post, has reported from 130 countries. How many countries are there? That must be <laughs> nearly all of them. Uh, she um, has worked for the Post, the LA Times, CBS News, and the Christian Science Monitor, spent five years in the Middle East, two years based in Europe, and seven years uh, in Africa. Her latest book is Dreams and Shadows, the Future of the Middle East. And Robin, I think I want to start with you because I think uh, in light of the news uh, on North Korea today, although we're going to focus on Iran, I think we really ought to take some notice of that. Uh, what does this mean and what's going to happen now? Well, uh, the North Koreans provided a declaration on uh, its nuclear program. It does not go far enough. It does not uh, address critical issues, including how many nuclear weapons it has, its uranium enrichment program, and particularly its proliferation, notably to Syria. Uh, and so there are a lot of questions that remain. It does not fulfill its obligation under, as part of the six-party talks. Uh, clearly, the uh, Bush administration thinks this is an important development because it's, the, it's a continuation of what happened with Libya, getting it to give up its weapons of mass destruction, and has particularly important repercussions for Iran, the kind of thing we'd like to do in reaching out on, uh, with the, uh, this, the, the world's ma six major powers in its recent offer this month uh, to, get, to, to begin a, some kind of dialogue with Iran if it suspends its own uranium enrichment. 
Uh, I should add, by the way, that Robin went to North Korea and was with Madeleine Albright when it, on a very similar kind of mission, didn't you? Does this, uh, how is this like, like that trip? Well, I often say it's deja vu because at the end of the Clinton administration, there was a, an attempt to get both Middle East peace and a deal with North Korea, and we're finding ourselves in very much the same boat on the same issues eight years later. Uh, would anyone else on the panel like to talk about this? Liz, what, what, do you, what are your thoughts in general on North Korea and this announcement today? Um, well, I think that actually I would agree with much of what Robin said. Um, I think it's, uh, it's concerning uh, for the reasons that Robin mentioned. Um, concerning because, although I'm not sure anybody's actually seen the declaration yet outside of the U.S. government, um, it, it looks like there were key pieces of the, Korea, the North Korean nuclear program that were left out. And so I think that it, it is um, a troubling development that we would be taking steps that seem to be significant steps in terms of removing them from the terrorist list um, and from the Trading with the Enemy Act sanctions in exchange for something that seems to be of, of questionable value. One of the things that's not apparently in the list of uh, nuclear activities that they handed over uh, is the number of nuclear weapons that they have. There apparently is, an, uh, that is not included in what we got, the information we got, nor apparently, is, is this right, Robin, there's no information on what the deal was between North Korea and Syria. Yeah, and, and, they, and they have to acknowledge that as for the U.S. to follow through, I think. Um, that's going to be, continue to be a big issue, particularly on the Hill. Do you think there's uh, any chance that uh, Secretary of State Rice would, uh, would go to North Korea now, as Madeleine Albright did at the end of the Clinton administration? I think the North Koreans would probably have to do an enormous number of things very quickly in order to get uh, Rice to make a trip. And I think it would probably be, be very controversial on the Hill uh, and probably some resistance within the administration or lack of enthusiasm, although I will defer to another on this panel um, who might, may know more than I do. I wouldn't be enthused. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think uh, Condoleezza Rice might be going? Well, I, I certainly don't want to speak for Secretary Rice. Um, okay. but, uh, but I do think I, it was interesting. There's been some great reporting in the Post, including by Robin. Um, Secretary Rice last week um, appeared at the uh, ed board of the Wall Street Journal, and then the Post picked up on her comments there, noting that we'd found traces of highly enriched uranium on some of the pages of the documents the North Koreans <laughs> turned over. So I think it's, uh, you know, <laughs> one has to wonder. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I commend Robin for some of that great reporting in the Post. All right. Can I just make sure. one small point? The, um, the, in terms of the price the United States has to pay, taking it off the terrorism list and the, uh, and the removing it from the uh, and trading with the enemies act that's not a huge price to pay as um, experts have been telling me all day long that North Korea except for the Japanese abductees which is an issue that dates back a long way North Korea has not been deeply engaged in terrorism for a long time in, in the kind of way we define terrorism and uh, there are still so many sanctions imposed on North Korea uh, that that lifting these restrictions won't have it's not going to lead to any major rush in terms of new business with North Korea. There will still be an enormous number of restrictions. So it's not a great price to pay either. And that's, we may be seeing a little bit of bazaarism, you know, in, um, I mean, bazaarism, trading bazaar, uh, in, in trying to get more for um, what they give up. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about what we came here to talk about, and that is Iran. Um, uh, Ken, uh, how would you? If you just give a picture of where, where Iran is today, what do you think they're trying to do? You don't mean geographically. I, I think we, most of us in this room probably I can know do that. pretty close to where it is. But where do you, what is Iran trying to do today? Are they trying to build a, a nuclear arsenal? Are they trying to develop uh, nuclear power for peaceful purposes? And if so, why? The first thing I'd say is I think we need to be very careful about making generalizations about the entire Iranian government right from the get-go. I know it's hard, and especially as we get going, all of us, myself included, are going to say Iran is doing this, Iran is doing that. But we need to keep in mind that Iran is a deeply fragmented political system. And different players within the Iranian political system often have very divergent views. They don't always support the policy being pursued by the government. And oftentimes, what you see the government doing is actually some effort to achieve a balance between very different fronts. I think it's clear that the Iranians have set themselves on a course that will allow them to have a nuclear weapons capability. 
the ability to build a nuclear weapon if they choose to do so. I think it's also clear that there are some elements within the Iranian system who would like to have the actual bombs themselves. Others who probably think that it'd be nice to have the bombs, but it's not a priority for them. And they might actually be willing to give up the capability in return for getting a whole lot of things. What we often see, at least my read of the Iranians, is that the supreme leader, the most important man, the most important person in the Iranian political system, Ali Khamenei, what he typically tries to do is to kind of satisfy all of the different elements of his political system by giving them a little bit of each. It may be that in 2003 he decided, you know what, we're going to give up this weaponization program. That's what the NIE said, but we're going to keep the uranium enrichment program going. That's the most important element in achieving this capability. It may also be that they haven't figured out among themselves whether they actually want the bombs or they just want the capability to build the bombs. A lot of people have suggested, including many Iranians, that what they're looking for is what they call a Japan capability. The ability to build bombs quickly, which is certainly what Japan could do. That may or may not be meaningful, depending on exactly how we respond, how the countries of the region respond. But what I think that it does for all of us at the beginning of this uh, conversation is it opens up the probability or the likelihood that we don't know exactly what the Iranians are trying to do. They're trying to acquire capability that would make a lot of countries very nervous. And I would say they should be very nervous. But I don't think that we have a clear sense of what Iran, as a collective, has decided they want at the end. It may actually be very responsive to our actions and other countries' actions. You know, it's very interesting to hear you say that because a diplomat from that part of the world uh, said to me um, a couple of weeks ago, Iran may not be where they would like us to think they are in all of this. What, do you, what would yeah, you say to that, I, John? I agree with Ken. I, I take it back a step. I'm not sure that they've decided what they want to do because I'm not sure they've reached a point in their program where they have to make that kind of decision. It seems clear to me that a lot of people in the Iranian government, and I take Ken's point that the Iranian government is not nearly as rational a beast as the U.S. government. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people in the Iranian government said, you know, keeping this in play is useful in lots of ways. It draws attention to Iran. It makes us a powerful country in the Gulf. It brings our Gulf neighbors to talk to us, to try to assuage us. I think in many cases, a lot of Iranians have written off the US as a country that can never have anything but a hostile relationship with Iran. So they don't really count that as a cost. And they say, you know, having this in play isn't such a bad thing. We'll sort of look at the next president. We'll see how that plays out. And we'll just keep it going. I, th I think w we make a mistake if we assume that there's an underlying goal and that they're all sort of resume builders racing to get the job at the end of their career they're all trying to get. I think they're in play. And they think having this as an element of being in play enhances Iran's position in the world and helps Iran reach what they think is their rightful position as a global power and certainly the biggest and most important power in this very oil-rich part of, of the world in the Gulf. Liz, I'm going to guess that you don't exactly agree with that because I, I just want to have a quote here that uh, someone gave me where you said, we don't have the luxury to have the debate we've been having about should we talk, should we not talk. The time for diplomacy here is rapidly coming to an end. Is this what you were talking about? Well, in part. I mean, my sense is that it's dangerous to sort of sit back and say, just because the international community, including the IAEA, um, you know, uh, has been pretty uh, unified in terms of reporting on Iran's efforts to attain a nuclear weapon, we ought to just assume, gosh, they're just trying to be in play. I mean, I think that the only responsible position as a, a nation that we can take is they actually want what they say they want, which is they want a nuclear weapon. And, and frankly, as we have gone forward here through an you know, uh, exhaustive round of diplomacy, I think that the costs for the Iranians so far have very clearly not been sufficient to get them off that path. Um, I think that this, this quote was really about sort of uh, the current political debate and the issue of do we talk to the Iranians, do we not talk to the Iranians. And my sense of it is that that's really the wrong question, that the real question we have to force ourselves to ask is can we live with a nuclear-armed Iran? And 
if we ask ourselves that question, then, you know, two different paths flow from that. And I think that you've got, you know, people in different camps in this city, not surprisingly. You've got some people who would say, yeah, we can live with it. You know, for a whole range of reasons, they can be contained, sort of the traditional diplomacy can work. We ought to just admit we can live with it and go forward. I think you've got others at the other end of the spectrum who will say, absolutely not, and this is where I am. We can't live with it, that it's an existential threat to Israel. Um, it's a significant threat to American national security. It's not something we can tolerate. I think the problem is you've got people in the middle, and those people in the middle say, we can't live with it. It's true. You ask them, and they say it's too dangerous. But, but they're not really willing then to take a hard look at, well, what does that mean? You know, has diplomacy worked? Has talking to Iran worked? Is it possible, is it likely um, that we're on a course here that will actually lead uh, the Iranian government to disarm? And well, I, I what does it mean? Uh, you know, I think that, that, that we've now seen just in the last few days the Europeans impose some pretty important sanctions. I, I'm not ready to say sanctions uh, will not work under any circumstances. I think there are some very tough things that could be done diplomatically. But I think there are two key things that have to happen. Um, one is I think we need to get some of our Arab partners into this uh, issue in a way that they haven't been. We need to get countries like the Saudis, for example, to say to the world, you know, we'll bank with you, but not if you bank with the Iranians. We need, we need there to be some real fundamental pain involved diplomatically for the Iranians to realize it's not worth the cost. But secondly, I think the Iranians have to believe that we will use force if necessary. And I, I'm concerned because you, you know, had statements for a period of time there from people like the chairman of the, or the uh, commander in CENTCOM who's since been relieved, suggesting that force was off the table. And the problem is whenever you've got statements like that, in my view, it actually makes the potential of having to use force greater, uh, you know, because people will think, well, if the Americans aren't serious about using force, there's no reason for us to, to participate diplomatically. And frankly, it convinces the Europeans that they maybe don't have to be as tough as, as we need them to be. Respond? The, the more we talk about force, I think the less likely you are to get Gulf ally cooperation on precisely the kinds of issues you're talking about. They are terrified. I think their worst case scenario is the U.S. goes in. Their second worst case scenario is the Iranians get the bomb. Their best case scenario is that we manage this stuff. I think the other part of this is if the goal of the diplomacy is to get an Iranian surrender, to get the Iranians to say, you're right, we're wrong, we're just going to turn all over. I think that's a really steep price for diplomacy. I think it's going to be really hard to get a country like Iran to do it. We've got Libya to do it. But I think it's going to be awfully hard to get Iran. If we can find a way to, to have something that's, is, I wouldn't say face-saving, but easier for the Iranians to swallow, which makes it easier to deal with Iran in the region, I think it's a much more likely path for successful diplomacy than saying either you pull a Libya or we're going to bomb you. Because well, I think I they'll think say, anybody, go ahead. Yeah, but, but two things on that. First, you and I have a fundamental disagreement about where our Gulf allies are on this issue, and I guess we're talking to different people. But I think that, that you have actually or for the same first people time. people are calling different things. That could be too. <laughs> um, but I think you've got for the first time in a long time, frankly, a convergence of interests between Israel and some of its, the, the Arab neighbors. I think actually a, a nuclear-armed Iran is a, a much worse nightmare for a country like Saudi Arabia, frankly, than, than it sounds like you perceive it to be. Um, but, but secondly, nobody is saying uh, Libya or will bomb you. I mean, we've now had, at least since 2005, significant aggressive diplomacy. And if anything, we've had a situation where, you know, just in the last couple of months, the Iranians are in a position where sort of they're not meeting any of the deadlines, they're not doing any of the things they're supposed to do, and the EU goes to them with a new basket of incentives. So I'd say, you know, nobody is actually pursuing the policy that you're suggesting. Um, if anything, in fact, you know, the Iranians are being offered carrots, uh, you know, repeatedly, and you know, learning a lesson from it, which is not an irrational lesson, which is, you know, why step off the track if we're going to get more carrots for staying on the track? How close are we to a nuclear-armed Iran? Ken? I have no idea. And honestly, I don't think anyone does. The estimates are all over the map. A lot of it is about uh, assumptions about what specific pieces of intelligence mean. I'll put it this way. I wouldn't bet that the Iranians will never have a nuclear weapon. I wouldn't bet that they wouldn't have one tomorrow. It's somewhere in between. I think most of the estimates are that somewhere, you know, it is several 
months, probably years down the road. Uh, but I don't think we know. And I think that you know, Liz makes a point that uh, we've played out a lot of the clock here. We've lost a lot of time. Personally, I think we still have more. Uh one little anecdote that's very telling. Uh, I interviewed the Minister of Defense in Iran uh, not too long ago, and, and he said to me, if only we were as bad as the North Koreans, maybe we'd be getting American aid, which, you know, was their prism. You know, I, I want to make a couple of points. I would go one step further than John did, and I think there's a danger that the more we uh, threaten force, the more the hardliners in Iran who may back a nuclear program will want it and use that as justification. I also think we've probably reached the point that I don't think that military option, the military option is really terribly viable for the United States uh, because, of our, our, um, because of Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think that we've looked at this issue just in terms of Iran and the U.S. when the reality is that Iran is, because of Iraq and Afghanistan, it is now the regional superpower. It has enormous leverage that it didn't have uh, four years ago, five years ago, and that uh, any military strike on Iran would have to involve not just whatever the sites we suspect may house uh, a program, but would also have to, to strike along the border at forward positions because we have to protect our troops in Iraq. That it would end up looking much more like a broader war than uh, just strikes on a military on military or suspected nuclear facilities. And that would backfire. Uh, and I th think there's a, there, is, there are a lot of people at the Pentagon who are not terribly enthusiastic about that particular option. Um, and I also think that because Iran has reached a point where it is so powerful, uh, we may be in a position that we don't particularly like where the diplomatic option of doing, you know, it's often been called the grand bargain and so forth, that that may be the only viable option to get them to give up um, whatever nuclear program they have. Uh, I don't think that they are going to suspend uranium enrichment at all. I think it, the price, unless they get something huge out of it, they're not going to do it in re based on what we offered them earlier this month from the six parties, a dialogue with the United States, incentives for um, you know, membership in the World Trade Organization, some kind of political dialogue, including them in a security forum. That's just not going to interest them. So that's dead in the water. They're going to wait until uh, the new administration comes in hoping that they're going to get something better. But I think that even if you got a Barack Obama offering them, you know, direct talks, that's still not going to be enough. They want it all on the table. And they've got enough chits, unfortunately, now that they can get a lot more than we would ever want to give them. Go ahead. If I could just comment on, on Robin's point. Um, I, I do think that's been part of what's been missing from our diplomatic efforts with the Iranians. Uh, and, you know, the simple way to think about it is that what's really been missing is a concerted multilateral effort, a concerted international effort. And I think that Liz would probably agree with us, that we haven't had a tremendous amount of support. Um, but what I would say about that, and Liz may disagree with this, is that part of the reason for that is that we've not been willing to do two things. First, we've not been willing to put up very big positive incentives for the Iranians in the event that they actually say yes. We've not been willing to say, we will lift our economic sanctions, we will not just bring you into the World Trade Organization, we will provide you with trade credits, we will provide you with investment guarantees, we will help you to address all of the crippling economic problems, which quite frankly are what really matter most to the Iranians. And I think that's an important thing to have on the table, not just because I think it makes the deal more attractive to the Iranians themselves, but more importantly in many ways because it makes the deal more attractive to our other allies, to the Europeans, to the Russians, to the Chinese, etc. I think the other part of it is that I don't think that we have been willing to do some real serious horse trading with our allies when it comes to Iran. We've not been willing to go in there and say, Iran is one of our highest priorities and therefore we are willing to bargain with you to get your support on this issue and in return we are willing to give you something that you want on some other issue. You know, look at how we have handled the Russians. We have antagonized them on every single issue that matters to them and then asked them to turn around and support us on Iran. I, I don't think that you could possibly imagine how they would be willing to do so. I can't tell you exactly what we should be willing to negotiate with the Russians because I'm not a Russia expert. But I think that the next administration is going to have to sit down and decide how important Iran is. And if Iran is one of the most important issues out there, and I believe that it is, we're probably going to have to say to the Russians, all right, 
here's what we want from you on Iran, and in return, here's what we're willing to give you on some things that matter to you. And my first, my top of the list would be missile defense. For me, missile defense is supposedly about the Iranians. I'd give that up in a heartbeat if that would help get the Russians on board for tougher sanctions on Iran. I, can I respond? Yes, ma'am. I mean, you know, it's striking to me um, the extent to which uh, the problem always seems to be us. And the problem always seems to be the United States hasn't yet offered up just the right concession. Or we haven't offered up enough concessions. And if we would just offer some more concessions, then the Iranians would suddenly, you know, Ahmadinejad would suddenly take more of an interest in the economic situation of his own people than in his nuclear weapons program. And I think it's, it's, it's a fundamental sort of misunderstanding of Ahmadinejad, of his motives, of his intents, of what he wants. And what concerns me is that, in fact, you know, you're in a situation now where we are about to have a new administration come in. And, and particularly if it's an Obama administration, you know, the incentive always is, well, gosh, let's just, you know, we'll be nicer. Let's just do some more. And one of the best lessons I learned about this was from Ken Pollack and the opening of Ken Pollack's book about Iran, where he talks about his experience helping to draft the speech Madeleine Albright gave when after, you can tell the story better than I can. I hate being quoted back to myself. I'm sorry, Ken. <laughs> but it's a great story. Hey, somebody read the book, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book. I highly recommend it to anybody who hasn't read it. Can I just make but, one, but let me finish. This is, let me no, just tell the story. Yeah. But, you know, the Clinton administration was approached numerous times by numerous uh, representatives saying, look, the Iranians want a better relationship with America. We've got a reform-minded president. We want a better relationship. Just apologize. Apologize for your support for the Shah. Apologize for your support for the coup. And, and we'll be there for you. We'll give you a better relationship. So we did. We stood up and apologized. And the response was, you know, well, the great Satan has finally admitted that you lied and that you're criminals. So what do you want from us? So I think that we, we have to be very, very careful, particularly because of the time frame we're facing here in terms of their progress towards a nuclear weapon, that we don't just sort of fall into, well, gosh, if we just gave them some more, maybe we could get them to turn around. But, Can I just say I'm, one I'm thing about Ahmadinejad briefly? And that is I think we all invest far too much. Uh, we're the ones who have given Ahmadinejad uh, the, the kind of status that he has. He is not an important person in Iran when it comes to national security. He's one person on, the on their National Security Council. It's a different, different makeup. Uh, he's one voice. And Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, is the one who will make the final decision. And talking about you know, uh, the Iranian leader, the president, is, is, I don't think, very productive when it comes to the but debate. Can, can I point out to you? First, it seems to me that, that Ahmadinejad is, is certainly a rising power vis-a-vis the leader, that, that he's getting more power. But the other part, and this goes exactly to, to Ken and Liz's point, our greatest asset in multilateral force in Iran is that Ahmadinejad is such an outrageous guy, that he keeps agitating everybody, he keeps saying stupid things. If it weren't for Ahmadinejad, if Ahmadinejad doesn't win the presidential elections in June, and instead we have somebody with precisely the same strategic goals, except he can keep his mouth shut and he understands the Holocaust really did happen, then we have a problem, because then everything we have been using to try to get the Gulf allies and the Europeans and everybody else to create a coalition against Iran, to really get them on board for some sort of diplomatic effort, suddenly everybody says, well, the Iranians are less threatening now. We have a president. He smiles more. He's not, you know, he's not crazy. And then suddenly that whole coalition falls apart. The, the best advantage we have in this is that they have a president who scares everybody. And if we have to deal with this, the next president has to deal with this, with a president who doesn't scare any, everybody, he's going to have a heck of a harder time than we have right now. Let me just go around the table here and, and maybe kind of make short answers to this question. Uh, <clears throat> we'll have an election. After the election, should the next president talk to Iran and under what circumstances, Ken? The next administration absolutely ought to offer to talk to Iran. Uh, under pretty much any circumstances. I think not making the offer hurts us more than making it. The question is, what do we talk about? What do we ask the Iranians to do? And what are we willing to do? Robin? Uh, it's probably an an something as a journalist I shouldn't answer. Okay. Liz? Well, I think there's a myth that we aren't talking to Iran. I mean, I think, you know, we've clearly got discussions underway in Iraq, um, which are supposed to be focused on, and as I, you know, for all I know, they are focused on, um, what Iran is doing in Iraq. Um, 
But I, I think it's very important for the next president to recognize that particularly a president himself offering to sit down with a, a foreign head of state, you know, that conveys a huge amount of legitimacy. And we've seen, again, I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, a shill here for the Washington Post, but we've seen, again, great reporting in the Washington Post um, by Glenn Kessler, actually, about the extent to which the Europeans who are involved in the EU3 negotiations are very nervous about Obama's offer to speak unconditionally to Ahmadinejad, that European diplomats, you know, who are not often known for uh, the steel in their spine, recognize that, in fact, this would be a setback, that it would harm the multilateral nego excuse me, negotiations that are going on now. So, you know, again, I think it gets us off onto an issue we shouldn't be focused on because, you know, it's a fun one to talk about, I suppose, but the real issue is what are you going to do to prevent them from attaining a nuclear weapon? John. Um, I want to underline Liz's point that, that there's a myth that this administration hasn't talked to the Iranians. We talked to the Iranians through and past the axis of evil speech. We talked to the Iranians about Iraq. I think this administration has talked to the Iranians more than they've not talked to the Iranians. But it seems to me that the structure of our discussions with the Iranians have too often been trying to take a lesson from the Syrian negotiating strategy. And the Syrian negotiating strategy with Israel has been, for four decades, concede everything we're looking for before we get in the room, and then we'll go into a room and have a negotiation. And I would point out that that negotiating strategy has gotten Syria not a single inch of the Golan back. We have to have discussions with the Iranians. I agree with Liz. You don't start off by saying our opening gambit is the president will come to Tehran, they'll say all the nice things, and then we'll see where we can go. But it seems to me that, that the structure of our negotiations has to be to be serious, to be meaningful, to have some sort of buildup where there's the possibility of actually doing something rather than saying drop everything we're looking for and then we'll talk to you. Um, we want to go to uh, questions from the audience, as we always do, and I'd like to give you a little warning so you can get your questions ready. So I'll ask a couple more questions, and then we'll be ready uh, to go to the uh, audience for questions. Uh, you gave some part of an answer to this, but one of the questions I brought here today is, why don't the Russians and Chinese do more uh, to stop Iran's nuclear program? Uh, are they just ignoring the threat from Iran? Or why, why are they not on board recognizing what so many in this country seem to recognize as a real threat? My conversations with them indicate that, by and large, they just have bigger fish to fry. They will all agree that the Iranians should not be allowed to have this capability, and they don't want the Iranians to have this capability. But they've got other issues on their plate that are more important to them. Uh, for the Russians, it's a whole series of things. It's Bosnia and Belarus and Ukraine and Chechnya and so on down the list. Missile defense, as I mentioned. For the Chinese, it's energy. And what's interesting with the Chinese is it's not so much energy from Iran per se. It is energy from the Middle East. And they will seem to make it clear that they'll take it from anywhere. But they've got to get it where they've got it. Now, unfortunately, they've got a, a zero-sum idea about energy, which is a very pernicious one, and that leads them to try to buy up uh, oil fields, basically, which is a, not a very smart way to go about things, and it sets them in competition with us. Um, but what they have said to me, at least privately, is, look, if you guys would meet us on our energy needs, we would be glad to help you with Iran, because at the end of the day, we're just not that concerned. I mean, what does that mean to help us with our, I mean, in how, how? I think from their perspective, and it's, it's hard to say, but I think from their perspective right now, it's a matter of the more that the United States made it possible for the Chinese to feel that their energy consumption requirements over the next 10 or 20 years would be accommodated by American actions and other actions, the more that they felt that there was oil and gas out there for them to consume, the more, the, more relaxed they would be about these other issues of which Iran is a part. And again, I think that's one where we could go to the, the Chinese and need to go to the Chinese and horse trade with them and say, what do you need? What can we do to reassure you about energy? And in return, will you join us in getting tough with the Iranians if we do these things for you? Robin? Can I just add one small thing? Um, my sense is that the relationship between Iran and China now has evolved to the point that it's not just energy. And it's been very interesting to see Iran. I've been going, traveling there almost every year since 1973 and watching um, Iran go from a country where, you know, the cars were American, the air conditions were American, the books, the, you know, the, 
the fast food joints. Everything was American. And then after the 79 revolution, they switched more to the Europeans. And then as the Europeans began squeezing, then they went, um, they bought, started buying more Korean and Japanese and so forth. And now it's China. And that, so it's a relationship that I think, um, because Chinese don't have human rights standards uh, and so forth, that, that you know, this is a great relationship for both parties and that we may find that it's, that even if we, if the Saudis would accommodate the Chinese on energy or others, uh, that, that it's a relationship that they actually like. And, I mean, John, you've also spoken that my sense is that it's a much better relationship for the Iranians than it is for the Chinese. Yeah. I, we well, just, it was a two-way relationship. That was my point. We just came out with a book on, on uh, China, the Middle East, and the United States. It was released on Tuesday. Um, well, I've, I've been to Beijing twice. I've spoken to a whole number of people in, in the government and in academia and journalism and, and elsewhere. Uh, my sense of, of the way that Chinese see all of this is partly to think the U.S. is going to take care of any real threat coming out of Iran, that they have no interest in really maintaining the security of the Gulf. They're happy for the U.S. to do it. But they're terrified the U.S. is going to start a war and disrupt their access to energy. They see their capacity to, to get through instability in, in the Middle East as much less than the U.S., a much more fragile economy much more dependent on imported oil. So my sense of what Chinese diplomacy is, is first, they're happy to play for time. They actually prefer to play for time. And where they'll go is the more the Iranians seem to be leaning toward conflict, the more they'll bandwagon with the US. And the more they sense the US is leaning toward conflict, the more they'll side with China. Their goal is to not have conflict. Because I think the Chinese are absolutely agnostic as to who's ruling the government in, in Iran, as to what the government of Iran is doing. They're trying to get the energy out. I just want the And oil. they figure anybody there <clears throat> is going to sell them energy. So they don't really care at all. It's a totally unemotional issue. I think it's refreshing for the Iranians to deal with somebody who just wants to make a commercial relationship and doesn't say, well, let's talk about your society. And they are trying to, to do whatever they can to just keep the energy flowing and not have a battle of any kind break out okay. in the Gulf. Liz, you want to wind this? Well, I mean, I'd like to actually broaden it up a little bit um, because this whole issue of sort of what inspires other governments to join us or not join us I think will be a critical one for the next administration. And the calculation um, in the Arab world is very different. And I think that the calculation there has been very much to watch America and to, to try to get a read on whether or not we are committed and we are dedicated and we are going to stay the course, both in Iraq and with respect to ensuring the Iranians don't get a nuclear weapon. And I think you see examples um, across the region. For them, it's not sort of this economic calculus. It's much more um, a willingness to sort of stick your neck out, a willingness to stand up and say, OK, we're with the Americans. We'll work with you on this. Depends very much on knowing that we aren't going to pull the rug out from under them. And depends very much on knowing that, in fact, we will follow through. And I think. Um, you know, while it is certainly the case that no one wants or wishes for conflict, um, in fact, I think John and I have a fundamental disagreement. I think that, that there are a number of nations in the Gulf for whom the prospect of a nuclear-armed Iran um, is one that is a, a, a much larger danger to them and something they fear much more than uh, the potential of U.S. military action uh, or other nation military action to ensure that program is set back. I mean, first of all, I, I know exactly the guys you're talking about, and I've met well, them too. Well, I think too. actually you don't know all the guys I talk about. Probably to not them, all of them, but a bunch of me. A bunch of them I do, because they've told me. Um, and you, you believe them? I believe some of them. Um, but I think the other thing is you said that there's a, a desire to see if the U.S. will follow through. And I think that, that underlines a really important issue, which I've heard a lot in the Gulf uh, and elsewhere in the Middle East, is it's very important that people have a sense of American reliability that not only the U.S. will do what it says it will do, but that it will do so successfully. And that, I think, is, is one of the ways in which Iraq has, has so much hurt the U.S. in the Gulf because of a sense that the U.S. isn't reliable, that the, the outcomes aren't reliable, and that causes people to hedge. That causes the Saudis to invite Ahmadinejad to Mecca. That causes, I think, the Arabs to be much more cautious and ultimately much less... Um, much less comfortable being 100% in the boat with us against Iran and much more saying, well, the Americans will take care of the big stuff with Iran and we'll try to improve the atmosphere. And it's, I, th I think we have to do something to, to recreate 
that sense of American reliability in the Middle East, which I think has been damaged over the last five years. Yeah, I think we do need to um, sort of get back to a point where people understood that you know our enemies should fear us and our friends could count on us. But I think the Iraq uh, effect is a more complicated one. Um, I think that particularly now that we've seen the success of the surge, um, you know, the situation now is one in which people are concerned that we will, in fact, leave and not reap the benefits of the success that we've had. And so I, I think it's not quite correct. It's more complicated than sort of saying because Iraq was harder, because Iraq took longer, um, nations now say, well, we're not sure we can count on the Americans. If we had not, in fact, gone through with the surge, if instead we had done what some were arguing then, which was to pull back and not to, not to actually be there to help the Iraqis win, um, I think that would have sent a hugely detrimental message. And I think that, you know, you see people in the Middle East in particular, but globally, following our political debates back here. And often, in fact, not making a distinction between, you know, Senator Biden says he wants to partition Iraq is, you know, often interpreted, uh, particularly in the Arab world, as, well, the U.S. government wants to partition Iraq. And not distinguishing between the Congress, the executive branch, sometimes failing to understand, you know, what can be a very muddy and complicated situation. But surely the debates that we have here about the extent to which we can walk away from the Middle East have a huge impact uh, and a detrimental impact, in my view, on getting people around the world to stand up with us for those things we say are very important. All right. Let's uh, take some questions from the audience. I'll start right on the front row. Hello, my name is Steve Piazzi from the International City the International City Managers Association. The first part of my question is for Ms. Uh, Cheney, and the rest is probably open to everybody. You mentioned that we should, when the Iranians say they want to develop nuclear weapons, we should listen to them. And I don't, I think it's, um, I don't know how safe it is to say that anybody in the administration in Iran has expressed a desire like that. Um, this leads to the second part, which is that every um, major grand ayatollah in Iran has issued, has a standing fatwa banning the development of nuclear weapons, including the Supreme Leader. And this is available on his website in like five different languages, and this has been stated. Even Sistani has issued a statement saying nuclear weapons creation is uh, forbidden in Islam. So I was wondering if this, this should play a, a part in our calculus. Liz first, the first part. Well, I think there's no question but that they've got a nuclear program underway, and I think the question is whether you uh, believe the assertions that it's for peaceful mm -hmm. purposes or not. And and it's not just the United States asserting that uh, they're developing nuclear weapons. I think you've got the IAEA and others engaged very directly in looking at the uranium enrichment, looking at the extent to which the Iranians have walked away from offers of uh, deals involving the Russians and others, where if what they really wanted was a peaceful nuclear program, they would have access to that technology and to the materials they needed for such a program, uh, which they don't have. So, um, you know, I think that, that you know, uh, to me that is a... a a case closed. I don't think there's any question but that they're attempting to uh, develop a nuclear weapon. Um, I think the question is how far along in the program they are and whether their efforts will be set back, um, you know, before they get to the point where they actually have a weapon. Robin, do you want to take the second part? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a very important point that um, given our Iraq experience, we all need to be very careful what we say because, as Ken pointed out, we don't know an enormous amount. We don't know very much at all. The IAEA doesn't either. And I will tell you, I covered the Iran-Iraq war, and I saw a lot of the chemical weapons victims in, um, uh, from Saddam Hussein's use of uh, a variety of wep um, chemical weapons against the Iranians. And there was an enormous debate in Iran about using chemical weapons in return. And at the end of the day, they didn't, even though the UN documented year after year after year after year that Saddam had used chemical weapons. Um, I think there has been restraint in the past. Um, it, I mean, I fully understand, and I would not be surprised if Iran does have a nuclear program, but I think we, we have to be very careful as a nation about how, much, how far we go in, in making these proclamations about what they're doing, in part because it is true that, that they have said, at least publicly, over and over and over, you know, that they're not. And I just think we need to be careful. Next question. Right there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jay Irwitz. I'm a lawyer at Wilmer Hale. Um, you know, are there any uh, elements within Iran whose uh, support uh, or whose success we might engender uh, who are less committed to a nuclear power program uh, and uh, who might be willing to make trades 
uh, more easily, and is there a realistic uh, chance of their success? Did you mean to say power? You mean nuclear reactor or nuclear power? I, I meant uh, nuclear weaponry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. If I could, uh, look, for me, this is, this is really what the game is about. Um, I would never take the military option off the table, but I do have a lot more reservations, I think, about it than Liz does. And in particular, at the end of the day, if you really decide, look, we simply cannot live with Iran with a nuclear weapon, what you're really saying is that we would be willing to invade Iran. And I don't think that the American public is ready to invade Iran to prevent it from having a nuclear weapon. So that bounds my, my, what I'm willing to do. I will say I'd really prefer that they not have it, and I'm willing to go to great lengths to prevent them from doing so. But what you're getting at is that I think at the end of the day, because I don't think the American public is willing to go there, it's about convincing the Iranians to turn off this program. And that's really actually what the Bush administration's policies have been about. I have problems with the tactics, but I understood exactly what they were trying to do, and I thought they were right. They were trying to convince the Iranians not to go down this path by creating an incentive structure that would enable those elements within Iran, and there are people within Iran who seem to indicate that they would be willing to give up this program under the right circumstances to do so, to win the fight against the Ahmadinejads and the other people who don't want to give it up. And my rationale, my argument has been all along that it is going to require a very powerful set of positive incentives and a very powerful set of negative incentives to win that fight. And that is why both strong sanctions and big carrots, big positive incentives, are both going to be necessary. And my final point is that I, I, I would disagree with Liz, as brilliant as her point was in, in quoting me, and of course it was a brilliant point, <laughs> I, I would disagree with her that I should, don't think we should see these things as concessions. They're not concessions, they're conditions under which we would, if the Iranians did the right thing, we would in response do the following things. And to go back to the previous question, it is worth always keeping in mind that the Iranian regime is very careful not to describe what they're doing as a nuclear weapons program. Because I think that they recognize that their people really wouldn't be terribly interested in that, even though some might, many others would be willing to give it up. They always describe it as about their economy. And I think that that reinforces this point that that's their Achilles heel. And that's where we can put the greatest pressure. And it, while it's true that Ahmadinejad doesn't seem to care about the economy and the impact that it has on the people, the supreme leader, as Robin pointed out, the man who's really going to make the decision, he does. I think there's um, an important uh, sort of point to watch, and it's building on something Ken said, which is um, sort of how does the Iranian public feel about the nuclear program? And, you know, there's been conventional wisdom um, sort of, you know, I'd say as long as Ahmadinejad has been in power, which is that it is a point of uh, national pride for the Iranian people, and that we risk um, offending that national pride if we assert that Iran doesn't have a right to a nuclear program. Um, nuclear energy program. Uh, right. But I think that, that you're seeing a shift even now on, specifically on this nuclear energy program. Um, and there have been some reports recently out of Tehran that you've seen graffiti, for example, playing on Ahmadinejad's famous statement now, which is, nuclear power is our national right. Um, and in some neighborhoods in Tehran, you've seen graffiti up on the walls saying, you know, Danish pastries are our national right. So people really sort of mocking Ahmadinejad and mocking the program. And my sense is that the Iranian public is sophisticated enough and aware enough of the extent to which their program is causing them to be an international pariah that we shouldn't be too quick to assume that, in fact, you've got sort of a majority of the Iranian public supporting a nuclear program of any kind. Oh, I, I disagree. I couldn't disagree more. There, every poll that's been taken, including by American groups using, you know, reliable polls, the right sampling and so forth, show that the overwhelming majority of Iranians believe that nuclear energy is their right. In Iran, they believe that that is the key to development. They think it's a proud culture and that's the only way they can restore their, um, to develop, you know, to be more than an oil power. And the fact is that Iran is scheduled to run out of oil in 2025, or run out of exportable oil in 2025. They really do need nuclear energy. So there may be, well, you know, anecdotal evidence no, about I, I think graffiti and so forth, but there's, n and in my own experience, and I go to Iran all the time, is that you, you find people who loathe the regime, who feel fiercely um, that, that, Iranian, that nuclear energy is, is the key to their future. 
Yeah, but I think, well, I mean, that's anecdotal also. But, but my only point would be that no, in I'm the talking same about polls, way, Liz. Well, <laughs> uh, right, but, you know, polls, particularly, I would say polls taken of Iranians by Americans are not always No, reliable. they're not by Americans. But, but my point is to say, in the same way that you're making the point that we need to be cautious about what we know and what we assert about their program, I think we need to be cautious and not talk about the Iranian people as all having a nationalistic sense of pride in demanding a nuclear power program, because I don't think it's as simple as that. I don't think it's as clear as that. And I think particularly in a time in which the Iranian people are facing increasing difficulties economically, um, you know, they are not uh, sort of sitting there in a vacuum without access to outside information. And I think they understand and they can see the extent to which resources are going towards this program the impact that it's having on Iran economically because of the external sanctions, I just don't think we ought to assume that they all are a monolithic group that has one particular view about sort of the, the benefits of a nuclear program. Let's, uh, did you want to say anything? Let's talk a little bit about sanctions, just sanctions in general. Are sanctions the answer here? We talked about the economy and what's important there. Will sanctions make a difference? Are they making a difference now? I think sanctions make a difference when they give a clear enough option to get out of them when they are specifically targeted, when they are broadly supported. I think one of the, the narrow sanctions often don't work. Sanctions with very muddy sorts of conditions, lots of conditions, you have to have a democratic government, those sorts of things you can't really judge don't work. But I think the most important part of this is Iranians have to feel that, or the Iranian government has to feel, that extremely discreet and doable actions will lead to discreet consequences, which can be positive or negative. And it seems to me that a lot of the sanctions that we've been doing have, have not had that sort of specificity that makes conditionality work. And Liz, I know you probably dealt with conditionality a lot when you were at IFC. It's, it's, it's something people debate about in the academic literature. It's hard to do. Um, and I think we rely on it to do more than often that kind of conditionality can, can accomplish. Can I, can I make a comment? Um, I've been looking at this issue of sanctions because I think it's really uh, interesting. Uh, two points. First of all, um, uh, I think the, the banking measures that have been taken over the last two years in encouraging international financial institutions to cut off credit, to cut off loans, has really hurt Iran in ways that we don't fully um, under you know we don't fully appreciate. That's probably been far more effective than the kind of sanctions that we've imposed through the United Nations, which you can sanction the Revolutionary Guards or the Quds Force or aid elements of them, and it doesn't really make much tangible impact. It's kind of psychological um, warfare, um, and I I also think that that sanctions are. Um, Iran is a funny place. I've, I lived in Africa during sanctions in, on Rhodesia and South Africa and so forth, and, and so it takes a long, long time to have an impact. And we've had sanctions on Iran, we have now for 30 years, and yet you can still get pamper diapers and Oreo cookies and IBM computers in Iran. You know, it's um, and you don't pay top dollar for them. I mean, it, it's a lot of stuff gets gets in. Um, so. Banking, I think, is, is what's begun to hurt them in a way that sanctions, the kind of sanctions we traditionally have imposed, have not so far. But I think there is another cost to it, Bob, yeah, if I could, okay. which is that you know, part of it is that Iran's economy, as you know well, Robin, uh, is deeply dysfunctional. And it's kind of impressive that even with $130, $135 a barrel oil, they are having such enormous economic problems. And they ration their own gas. Right, exactly. And mm -hmm. the fact of the matter so is that a lot of what our th sanctions are doing are preventing them from taking advantage of international trade and international investment, international finance to solve those problems. And I think that's why you're seeing this issue surfacing in the debates among Iranians. And just to go back to my previous point, that's what this is all about. It's not about starving the Iranians to death. Nobody wants to do that. It's about convincing the government that its current course is not a productive one and that it would be better for them to do something different. And again, however we're hurting their economy, and I'm not convinced that they, I, I suspect, Robin, you've got a better sense of how the sanctions are hurting their economy than they do. I think for them it's much more episodic. It's much more kind of uh, ephemeral, atmospheric. But the more that they feel it and the more that they think that their own economic problems and the more that their people think that their economic problems are being caused by the sanctions and therefore want the sanctions gone as a way of dealing with those problems, that can have the effect that we want. It can provoke the debate that we're trying to get. Any more questions? Right here. 
Jim Norman. I have no particular affiliation at the moment. Um, <clears throat> there seems to be consensus that at the end of the day, we don't really know the status of Iran's nuclear weapons program. And there's been talk of other nuclear players like Israel, Russia, and China. But no one's mentioned Pakistan or India. And since they're right there in the neighborhood, what impact do they have on any negotiations or any diplomatic strategies that would involve an Iranian nuclear weapons program? Anybody who would like to talk about that? Me? Robin? <laughs> um, I'm not sure all that much. Uh, India, because of energy, you know, that gives, that's another dynamic that, that gives Iran a market for its oil. Um, and they supply a lot of the gasoline to Iran. Exactly. Um, so it's a two-way, again, it's another two-way uh, economic relationship that, that's important to both countries. Um, Pakistan. Uh, Has I'm, its own problems. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, Iran, frankly, lives in a neighborhood. Five of the eight world's eight nuclear powers are nearby, either on its borders or nearby, and that shapes a lot of its thinking. Um, more than uh, that's the most impact I think it has. The, right here. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to call on all men so far, but it just they first up with their hands. I'm yeah. from Voice of America. And there is call for negotiation with government in Iran. Also, uh, the government of Iran has been called illegitimate, unelected, and has been condemned by the whole world, international human rights protection uh, organizations for abuse of uh, human rights and so on. So if you suggesting to talk to Iran, who do you talk to? Uh, Ahmadinejad, Khatami, uh, Rafsanjani, Supreme Leader, during all of them, there has been so many oppression of the newspapers, uh, uh, violation of human rights, and uh, closing the newspapers and media. Who would you talk to? It's a very good question. You want to start? Why don't we just go around here and get the various... Uh, you don't, you don't start with a cake shaped like a key. Um, <laughs> Am I the only one old enough to I, know I, that? I, I'm old enough. <laughs> um, I think you ultimately have to, to talk to a range of people. I mean, I, that my sense of, of the way Iran works is that, you know, we have a balance of powers with, with three branches of government, and each one sort of constrains one another, and, and you can actually diagram it. My understanding of Iran, which I'm sure is less sophisticated than your understanding of Iran, is that the balance of power is that everybody has four people in government who are constantly trying to undermine them. And everybody in the government is trying to undermine everybody else. And to move things forward, I don't think you can just have a single point of contact and a single, a single avenue. My sense of how we'd have to engage Iran would be to try to engage different groups simultaneously and then bring this together at some point as, as we moved up the chain. Does anybody else want to talk about that? Uh, well, I don't think we should be talking to them, but I do think well, that... we are. <laughs> that doesn't mean we should be. Okay. Just um, checking. Although I do think there's a group that's gone unmentioned here, which is the Revolutionary Guard Corps. And I think that, you know, there, there's a real question. If, if you're, you know, going to engage in discussions with a nation like Iran, you know, shouldn't you consider the power that somebody like Soleimani has um, and how in the world do you begin to engage in negotiations with somebody like that? I mean, I think, you know, fundamentally, again, the, the important point of negotiations is that you negotiate from a position of strength. And it seems to me that right now the Iranians have been very clear about exactly what they want, what their objectives are. And it's hard to imagine a scenario in which we as Americans go to them uh, at a time when, you know, we have been working to impose these sanctions multilaterally um, and say, all right, now forget about everything we said. We want to sit down and, and talk to you. Uh, and that that is perceived as anything but us going to them sort of hat in hand from a position of weakness. And, and my sense is that that could be, in fact, very, very dangerous. But I would like to hear from, uh, you know, sure. and, and Rob about sort of their view of the uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps and the role that it's actually playing in sort of the leadership of the country. Sure. I'll start by saying that at the end of the day, the Re Revolutionary Guard Corps will do what, Khatami decide, or what Khamenei decides. Um, they help shape his attitude. They are part of the discussion, but when he makes a decision, they fall in line. And again, that's why he is the critical actor. And I think you're right that they're an obstacle. They're part of that group that John was talking about that's constantly trying to undermine everyone else. 
but I don't think that we should allow them to necessarily dictate our actions. Um, I would also say that while it's always nice to negotiate from strength, you don't always have that luxury. And sometimes you just have to negotiate. And I think for me, what's important is not so much that we're having the conversation, but what we say. And under any set of circumstances, we don't have to, we don't have to necessarily go into negotiations with the expectation that we're going to cave. We have things we'd like from them. They have things that they probably like from us. You use the negotiations to see if you can establish that. And the last point I'd make is, I think there's one other group that I think everyone on the panel will agree, we also need to be talking to, and that's the Iranian public. And I think that we've not done a very good job of engaging them either. And I think that there's a lot of mythology among the Iranian public as to exactly what the United States is and is not trying to do. And I think we have to do a much better job of actually speaking directly to them and making it clear to them that some of the things that they're hearing from the regime are not true that we're not trying to overthrow the government, that we're not looking for an excuse to invade them, at least I hope we're not looking for an excuse to invade them, um, and that we, will, we acknowledge that they have legitimate security concerns and we would like to see them brought into the community of nations and we might even be willing to help them to solve their own economic problems. I think all of that could be very useful. Uh, Liz, let me just ask, may I just follow up on something you said? You said that, that you don't think we should be talking to them. Uh, just briefly, what do you think we ought to be doing? Just exactly what we're doing now? Uh, should we take it somewhere beyond that? What, well, what should you know, we I do? I think that, that uh, we're in a situation now where there are things that, that we could have done, frankly, previously, particularly um, with respect to Syria, um, that, that I think we failed to do and that would have put us in a stronger position now than, than we uh, find ourselves in. Um, but I think that, that clearly we need to say to the Iranians, you know, we, we're not fooling here. And we aren't willing, um, President Bush is not willing to be the president on whose watch the Iranians attain a nuclear weapon. I mean, it seems to me that no president would want that. And so I think that we need to do everything we can to dispel this idea that somehow we don't have the capacity militarily to take action if necessary to set back that program. I, I would disagree with Robin on that. Um, but I think that the fundamental key at this point, given where I think they are on their program and given how little, frankly, I'm willing to risk in guessing about that, um, is for them to recognize that, you know, despite what you may be hearing from Congress, despite what you may be hearing from others in the administration who might be saying force isn't on the table, that we're serious. We will not um, tolerate a nuclear-armed Iran. And, and it seems to me that that's the only responsible position for us to take. But it, it leads to a question that I wanted to ask Ken, which is, would you be willing to enter into negotiations like the ones you're describing if you knew that while those negotiations were underway, you were in fact providing cover for the Iranians to get to the, the end point in their nuclear weapon program, to get an, you know, enough centrifuges that they could then produce a weapon? Well, you've, you've defined the terms in a way that I couldn't possibly agree to, um, which is providing cover for them to do that. On the other hand, if you're talking about the current circumstances where it's clear that they're going to be moving ahead with their centrifuges, why not? We're not stopping them for otherwise. Um, the negotiations might cause them to stop. More important than that, the negotiations might give us leverage with our other allies to help them bring greater pressure to cause the Iranians to stop. Except what, what you would usually see happen in these circumstances, and I think what the history of, of this particular diplomacy has shown, is that when the talking is underway, when the diplomacy is underway, it's always a reason not to be too tough. It's always a reason to sort of say, you know, gosh, don't take that step, because if you take that step, then the talks are going to fall apart. You know, how do you avoid, in a bureaucracy like ours, the talks becoming the end objective? I think, as you well know, that is one of the needs, one of the requirements of leadership. You need a president who's willing to step in and say, the talks are not an end in themselves. They're a means to an end. And when would you, I'm sorry, Bob. I just, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm looking for a second career here. <laughs> no, I just, um, when would you stop the talks? When would you say, okay, that's it. We've, they've run their course. It's clear they're not going to work. We're, you know, that's it. There are a variety of different circumstances when I think that that could be the case. If it becomes clear to us for one reason or another that the Iranians are just trying to buy time, that would be a reason. If the Iranians cross some threshold that we, as the, through the course of the negotiations, had specifically gotten an agreement from them that they wouldn't do so, when another option opened itself up, all of those to me strike me as reasonable reasons to end negotiations. But they've but, done all of those things over the course of the last, you know, three years anyway. 
So yeah, let's let me just well, let me just inter interject <laughs> something here. Let's just say, um, for the sake of discussion, that the diplomacy has ended. We're talking about military options should be on the table. What military options? Well, I you know, I'm uh, not an expert on military options, and I hesitate to be very specific, given that people may attribute what I say to others. Yes. Um, <laughs> But, but, but we won't tell. Yeah. <laughs> right. Isn't this off no, the but record? I, yeah. <laughs> no, look, I mean, I think there are clearly a number of things that we could do um, that would have an impact in setting the program back. I don't think that it's responsible for anybody to minimize the difficulties involved, um, to minimize the potential for Iranian retaliation. And it seems to me that's why this issue always fundamentally comes back to are you willing to accept a nuclear armed Iran? And if you lay out sort of the risks that go along with a nuclear armed Iran, are those more detrimental potentially to the United States and to our allies than the risks of Iranian retaliation? But it, but it does seem to me United. that when you talk about, well, we'll just resort to military action, that's a very complicated question to try no to question. answer. I mean, no what question. military action? What what would an invasion of Iraq look like? Or would it, it be an invasion? Be an invasion? Can I make one I point? Yes. You think Iraq was complicated or messy and we came up with unexpected, uh, you know, obstacles. Iran would be many, 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 many times more difficult, more complicated, messier, bigger population. I mean, I just, it's such a nightmare. I, I find it hard to even fathom that people who know Iran really believe that's a viable option. But that's, I just where, wanted, but that's where you get to, then you would come down on the side of saying that entails more risk and more potential harm to our national security than allowing them to attain a nuclear weapon. I mean, ultimately, you know, if, if you think the diplomacy is going to work, then you let that go as far as you can. But ultimately, you come to that, that fundamental well, we're, choice. Well, you're talking about a hypothetical, but the fact is we haven't even tried the direct dialogue you know, negotiation um, side of it. You know, you, it's, it's leaping once again to military force without trying the other steps along the way. I was saying by Ken, do you want Just to uh, a couple of things. First, I completely agree with Robin uh, that an invasion of Iran, the way I like to describe it, is you know, Iran has three times the population, four times the land mass, and five times the problems of Iraq. Uh, I don't think that the American public is gearing up for an invasion of Iran. Well, there, is, there is the airstrikes option. And as an old military analyst, I, I looked at this in great detail. The problems with the airstrikes, though, really lie in the kind of future outcomes. We can obliterate everything in Iran if we choose to do so. Our Air Force and Navy are not bogged down in Iraq. In fact, they're looking for something to do. <laughs> the problem is that when you start looking at, all right, let's assume for a moment that we actually had perfect intelligence, that we actually know where all the Iranian nuclear facilities are, and we obliterate every single one of them. What are you going to get at the end of the day? Chances are you are going to engage Iranian nationalism. And whatever the, the right answer is between Liz and Robin at the moment, I think that we can all agree that chances are if the United States launches an unprovoked war against Iran and obliterates several dozen or several hundred facilities in Iran, that is going to engage Iranian nationalism. And that is going to work very much in the favor of Ahmadinejad and the Revolutionary Guards. They are going to be very much in control. What's more, I think it's also clear that that will justify rebuilding the nuclear program. And they will say, we need a nuclear weapon to prevent the Americans from doing exactly what they just did to us. And what, what would what be the international the, reaction would be? Well, I'm gonna, let me just say this. Before, what would be the reaction in the neighborhood? In the neighborhood, in Iran's neighborhood. Uh, what would be the impact on the price of oil, for example? Um, I mean, the, the Robin West knows more about well, Marcus and I do said today would He's pick here. a number. He was here. Was he? <laughs> said pick a number. Two hundred isn't too high. Yeah. I mean, it would go up. But but I think that there's a fundamental issue, and I think Ken and, and Liz may disagree on on this judgment. And the issue is, is Iran merely hostile, or is it irrational? If Iran is merely a hostile power, they are a weaker power, and we can successfully deter them. If they're an irrational power, there is no set of deterrent forces we can assemble which can protect the neighborhood from an Iranian strike. If indeed they are an irrational power, then I think it leads you to Liz's point 
that an Iranian bomb is an intolerable threat to a very important part of the world. If they are merely a hostile power, as I think comes through in, in Robin and Ken's analysis, that leads you to a whole different set of outcomes and leads you to how do you design a way to deter Iran because ultimately Iran's nuclear arsenal, even if they create one, if, if they get to that point, how do you manage that given American military capability? Now, I think Liz is in part coming down on both sides of this because she's saying we should present them with the option, we should, we should give them a clear choice, but that partly depends on a, a sort of rationality that they'll make the right choice. Well, you I, want to respond? Yeah, I mean, I, look, back. I think it's dangerous to say, "Well, gosh, they're irrational." Um, I think they are—they're dangerous, and I think they're dangerous for a number of reasons. Some of which we haven't talked about. You know, their support for Hezbollah. You know, an Iran armed with a nuclear weapon can make an announcement to the world: "We have a Hezbollah cell in Chicago, and it's got a nuke, but we're not going to tell you where it is." And unless the United States does the following things immediately, we're setting it off. I mean, the, the potential for blackmail because of Iran's connection to terrorism, for example, is one of the things that makes Iran a threat with a nuclear weapon and, and, and makes me much more skeptical about the ability to, to contain and deter a nuclear-armed Iran. Right. Add to that, sorry, just one more point, but okay. add to that Iran's constant statements about its ability, its willingness, the need to obliterate Israel, I think, you know, one ignores those uh, only if one is sort of fundamentally irresponsible in, in you know, uh, maintaining our own national security and the national security of one of our, our greatest allies. All right, we're coming into the uh, final turn here. Uh, there's a gentleman right back here that has had his hand up and tried to ask a question. You, sir, would you like to? But it's kind of been answered already. I was going to ask about day two, and that's kind of been answered. All right, then right here. Yes, purchase layer with the Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, waiting for my microphone. To, um, to mix metaphors, uh, if the reports of Michael Gordon are an outward invisible sign of something and the words of various Israeli officials are to be believed, we may be uh, dodging an 800-pound wrench here, which is to say, what if Israel metaphors. takes action first? What then? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, so we'll start with Ken. We'll just get everybody a chance to. First, I actually think that the likelihood of Israel, I, I don't think it's zero, but I don't think it's quite as high as, as people are getting worked up about. My experience with the Israelis is they know our intelligence capabilities in, intimately. And we only find out about their exercises when they want us to find out about their exercises. That said, I think that they are trying to signal that we are really concerned about what's going on here, and you guys don't want to let this go too far down the road. You know, what happens? Uh, look, my guess is if the Israelis actually do something, you're going to, they are going to provoke an Iranian response. What I don't know is how the Iranians respond. Uh, you know, this government has some interesting ideas about Israel and its connection to the United States and other countries in the region. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. It is conceivable to me that they decide to retaliate against us in addition to the Israelis. But my guess is, and I know that this is something that Israelis are concerned about, and it is one of the disincentives that they face, is I think the Israelis are very nervous that if they do it, what happens is actually that Hezbollah and Hamas are told, we gave you guys 15,000 rockets for a reason. Use them. I think the danger is that... Uh any action by Israel will be seen as having not just received an amber light from the United States, but a green light, and would probably have to involve, they will believe, some complicity, whether it's flying over Iraqi airspace, um, you know, use of some kinds of warplanes or equipment that's supposed to have limits on them, that there will be a perception that this was not an Israeli operation, but an American-Israeli operation. Liz? Um, you know, I... I don't disagree with very much of what they said, of what Robin and Ken said. I mean, I, I suppose I think that the Israelis mean it when they say that it's an existential threat to them and that they make calculations accordingly. Um, and I certainly don't think that we, you know, should do anything but support them because um, I think it is an existential threat to them. John? Uh, I, I, I mean, I agree with everybody. I, I think the is, no, I mean, the, the Israelis are really nervous. And I think the Israelis are genuinely puzzled both about what the Iranians are up to 
and what they can do about it. Um, I imagine that part of this exercise was a signaling exercise to the rest of the world saying get serious. Partly it was for them to see what they could really do and to, to make sure that they had that option. But I don't think the Israelis are confident they have that option. The Israelis aren't confident we're going to deal with it for them. And they're not confident the Iranians are going to behave. And if the Iranians don't behave, they're seconds or minutes away from having a nuke on their doorstep at some point in the future, and they don't know when. Can I just say one thing? You, you, um, this is not the first time the Israelis have engaged in long-range military exercises like this. They've done it uh, at least a couple of times in previous years. So, you know, it's, it's a signal, but it's also something they want to have the capability to do. If nothing else, it should underscore the point that Iran's pursuit of this capability, whatever their ultimate goal is, is in and of itself inherently destabilizing and something which we ought to try to turn off if we possibly can. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're uh, kind of at the end of this one. I, I didn't hear many coughs out there today, so I let this one run a little longer than it normally does. You're very attentive. Thank you very much on behalf of PCU. Of course, our uh, partner in all this, uh, CSIS, we're going to take off July and August, but we'll be back, as we say on television, for the new season in <laughs> September. Thank you all very much.